Okay, so uh, the course continues and I want to talk today really about the talk on module of diamonds. Um, so let me try to briefly summarize a little bit of the last lecture by drawing a big diagram of various objects that occurred last time. So you had this category. So one notion that was introduced last time was the category of strictly totally disconnected perfectoid spaces. <coughs> These were ones which are essentially pro-finite sets of geometric points. <coughs> then you had totally disconnected perfectoid spaces. These were in some sense pro-finite set pro sets of points. Um, those were all examples of ephenoid perfectoid spaces. which of course are examples of factoid spaces. <coughs> and <coughs> then we uh, enlarged the category of, I think you put this here, of factoid spaces into this category of diamonds, uh, which were these quotients of Ah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. I mean, let's say that everything in this diagram is of characteristic P. Quotients <coughs> uh, of perfectoid space of characteristic P by a pro -tall equivalence relation. And then I introduced the strengthening, uh, this topological condition of spatial diamonds. And uh, you can slightly weaken this and talk about locally spatial diamonds. So these are ones which have an open subcover by spatial. Well, just, I mean, this is a quasi compact and quasi separate in this condition. This is somehow. Uh, it's like locally spectral. So these have a spectral underlying topological space, and these have a locally spectral underlying topological space. Okay? And if you have such a guy whose underlying topological space is spectral again, then you are spatial. Um. <coughs> Then you could further generalize this whole situation to uh, include all V sheaves. <coughs> you could also define uh, locally spatial V sheaves. Um. <coughs> these are, by definition, I want all of these guys to be small if I say that they are locally spatial. And these are contained in all possible v sheaves. <coughs> uh, there is another inclusion here, and there is another inclusion here. <coughs> okay. Right, so that's another thing I should draw is that there is also a functor uh, actually here uh, from analytic attic spaces over ZP. <coughs> this is functor X maps to X diamond. So last time I stated that if you have a QCQS analytic attic space then the diamond is spatial <coughs> and the more general statement is, is that if you have any analytic attic space, then at least you're locally spatial. Because you have this open subcover by these QCQS guys. <coughs> uh, maybe another thing I should have said. Oops. 
some hand here. Okay. Oops. Is that <coughs> uh, if you're trying to understand containment here, it's uh, just a condition about points. This was his uh, final theorem I stated last time. I stated it for spatial guys, but it extends immediately to the locally spatial case. All right. And so two other definitions that I want to briefly recall. Uh, uh, also, it will be important today uh, that a morphism of sheaves is a tall if for all uh, perfectoid spaces X with a map X to Y. Uh, the fiber product is representable, I mean, meaning the total space and eta. And it's quasi pro eta. Um, if for all strictly totally disconnected x. Jumping to y. Uh, the fiber product is representable in proto. So here for Charlie is the same as <coughs> the weakest uh, when Well at, in the separated cases it's equivalent to like the weakest possible statement. So um ah, only, yeah, only was separated. So in the non separated cases it's a slightly tricky notion still. So you can still weaken it by doing okay. Yeah. So in practice, one can often replace y prime with something sep some separated space, and then if you map a separated space to anything, the map is also separated. So it's usually this is not much of an issue. All right. So uh, <coughs> uh, the main ah. So what is a separated vector? Uh, uh, Oh, maybe I can give these definitions right now. Uh, let me give, give some other definitions. Um, let me say it's a closed immersion if for all totally disconnected x to y, uh, y prime times y, x to x, representable and a closed immersion. And now I didn't say what this means. In this case, it just means that this is equal to, well, as I said, a totally disconnected space is essentially just a profinite set of uh, points. And so you just single out some closed subset of this profinite set of points. You have higher rank valuations there, so you can stick. Yes, but because everything needs to be, uh, well, it's supposed to be a closed immersion, so all the specializations must be in there, and all maps of analytic attic spaces are generalizing, so all the generalizations must be in there too. 
And so you don't really have any choice except to take the whole connected component. <coughs> it's separated uh, if the diagonal is closed. Immersion and while we're at it, let me also define properness right now. Uh, sorry, uh, yes. Uh, proper if it's quasi compact, separated, uh, and universally closed. Ah, universally closed means. Uh, universally closed means that, okay, uh, <coughs> quasi compacity is some kind of relative smallness condition. So it means that, okay, so let me just say this. So for all, let's say perfectoid spaces X uh, with a mapping to Y, um <coughs> the fiber product will be a small V sheaf. And so it has an underlying topological space, and you ask that the map to X is closed. And quasi, -comp and, uh, quasi compact means that for every. Thing well, I mean, it's this usual thing which you have in any topos. So uh, whenever you pull back to some object, the fiber product is quasi compact. And this means that whenever you have uh, any cover of it, there's a finite subcover. Yeah, but when you take a quasi compact object. Okay, yeah. here the topos are queer and far away. So. Yes, yes. <coughs> um, and the remark is that. Uh, so you may wonder that I'm always asking slightly different conditions on the axis that I'm pulling back to. And the reason is that I want all my notions to be V local so that you can check them v-locally on the base. And to arrange this, uh, you need to ensure that these notions satisfy appropriate descent uh, theorems. And these descent theorems are always true in, like, if the base is one of these sorts. And so that's why you need these kinds of assumptions. So uh, three, four, and five. And one and two in the separated case. Uh, can be checked V locally on the target. Meaning that if you have another sheaf Y tilde mapping to Y, uh, <coughs> which is a surjective map of V sheaves, and the pullback is, has this property, then already the guy itself has this property. So uses uh, some descent results. Uh, and these, the precise phrasing of these sense results explains the precise uh, wording of the de definition. So we need the descent for separated terms. Right, but I had descent for separated term maps last time, right? And also, while we're uh, at this, uh, let me explain that there are evaluative criteria for separatedness and properness. <coughs> um. Let's just be a morphism of fish sheaves.
Uh, then f is separated. If and only if f is quasi-separated. So again, this is a uh, notion which you have in any topos, meaning, uh, well, whenever you pull back to something, uh, say it's an infinite perfectoid space, the pullback is quasi-separated. And quasi-separated means that the final product of any two quasi-compact things mapping to it is quasi-compact. So there's... Um, and uh, for all perfectoid fields K, there's some open and bounded variation suffering. <coughs> K plus and K. Um, <coughs> if you look at a uh, diagram as follows. So, ah, so <coughs> whenever you have a non Archimedean field, I denote by OK its ring of integers, meaning the subring of power bounded elements. So, this is what's sometimes denoted by K circ for a general ring. <coughs> and this K plus will always lie in there. So, this is a thing which corresponds to the rank 1 variation. But you might possibly have a higher rank. This k plus correspond, could correspond to a higher rank valuation. <coughs> so the spark k OK is really just a point. But it sits inside this slightly bigger space, spark k k plus, might, which might be this totally ordered chain of points. So this is what corresponds to the fraction field and the valuation ring in the world of schemes. And so you have this mapping to y prime. Uh, you have this mapping to y. And you wonder about lifts here. And the condition is that there is at most one lift. At most one lift. And then there's a similar criterion for proper maps. In this case, you need to ask is quasi compact and quasi separated. <coughs> and then you ask the same condition. And in the same diagrams, there exists a unique error. I mean, there exists exactly one. Is it enough to demand the existence of an error after an extension of k? Uh, yes, you can. I mean, the usual business that you have for schemes, it works here as well. You can. You could also assume that k is algebraically closed. This kind of business works. Um, great. So, uh, oh, I still want to say something from this page. Um, so now we want to. Uh, Next, I want to talk about etal sites. And uh, for a general diamond, say X, uh, it is not clear that there are any etal maps into X. Non trivial.
<coughs> because the only thing which we are given for a diamond is that there's a quasi proton map into it. But it's not clear that there's certainly probably no tall maps from perfectoid spaces into here because then we could more easily write this diamond as a quotient of a perfectoid space by an Ital equivalence relation. So you can only expect that there are some other diamonds somewhere with an Ital map. <coughs> but it's not clear how to produce such guys. But the issue goes away under this uh, topological condition of being spatial or just locally spatial. Um, but there are such maps. X is spatial. And then also in the locally spatial case. <coughs> uh, and that's because of the following theorem. X is a spatial diamond. Um, someone can find co filtered in this system of Ital maps. X I tilde mapping to X. <coughs> um, I can assume that they are quasi compact se and separated, say. Uh, I could even assume more. <coughs> um, such that the inverse limit, the inverse limit taken, of course, in the category of pro all or V-sheaves on the category of uh, perfectoid spaces of characteristic P, such that this guy is representable, and in fact is such a strictly totally disconnected perfectoid space. So that's something that I said orally for affinoid perfectoid spaces, and in this case you would just take um, some kind of inverse limit of all possible Ital maps. <coughs> but in fact this works for any such spatial diamond. Okay. So just by using the Ital maps you can build such a pro system which will completely disentangle the whole space. Um, and then one can also arrange which is a technical point, but a technically very important point, uh, that this map from x infinity tilde to x is universally open. <coughs> As, yes, uh, otherwise it is completely uh, useless. Uh, uh, such that and yes, subjective. I mean, it's automatically quasi. It's automatically quasi proital for the definition essentially. Um, <coughs> so in particular, this will give you one way to write x as a quotient of a perfectoid space by by a proital equivalence relation because this map here is quasi proital. All right. Um, for example, one corollary of this is that uh, <coughs> is that the category of spatial diamonds is closed under fiber products. I don't want to explain how this follows, but it has to do 
with this points the topology underlying the definition of spatial guys and the fact that the sky is universally open. Uh, so are there products or only five or no product, there's an issue. Um, if you take two quasi-compact objects, their absolute product is not quasi-compact again. Because if you take FP Long series T, or its perfection, and the LX spectrum, would you let me give the example in a second. Um, uh, it's also closed under co-filtered in this case. <coughs> Kernels of double arrows are also allowed. Hmm? Kernels of double arrows exist. Uh, and kernels of double arrows, arrows and so all connected limits. Um, uh, so yeah, maybe I should make this general warning and should have done much earlier. Is that <coughs> a product of quasi compact <coughs> and perfectoid spaces x1, x2 is not quasi compact. In I think all cases, except where one, maybe one of them is empty. Um, so, for example, if you take the eddic spectrum, of this guy and takes the absolute product <coughs> with itself, then, <coughs> well, one way to think about this is that this is some kind of, you should like to think of this as some punctured formal open unit disk. Like FP power series would be like a formal disk and then you puncture it by going to the, by inverting T. And you would expect that if you base change this to any non-Archimedean field, for example, this guy, uh, you get, like, over this field now you have, an, you have a physical punctured uh, open unit disk, and that's actually what you get. So you get some D star uh, over FP long series. Some punctured open unit disk. So if you think of this as a rigid space, it's a set of all x whose absolute value lies strictly between 0 and 1. <coughs> but such a guy is, of course, not quasi-compact. <coughs> so an equivalent way of saying this is that the final object is not quasi-separated. Category of these sheaves, say. I mean, this V sheaf which sends everything just to a, a point um, is not quasi separated. And, well, this is slightly something funny, uh, sometimes something funny because, but. So in topos theory, the only <coughs> definable algebraic topos were the product of two quasi separated, quasi separated. This whole thing I suppose. The product of quasi separated is still quasi separated, yeah, that's okay. No, I think it's an algebraic topos, yeah. But one consequence of this, for example, is that an object being quasi-compact is different from asking is that the map to the final object is quasi-compact. So this object here, just one of these affinite perfectoid spaces, is quasi-compact. But the map to the final object is not, because if you take the product with this guy, you get something which is not quasi-compact. Sometimes you have to be careful about what you say. 
Um, <laughs> well, it's just the, the sheaf which sends everything to a point. It's, the problem is that it's not an object in our category because it's some of the eddic spectrum of FP if you want, but FP is not an analytic object. <coughs> okay, so uh, let me now introduce different sites. So there's a definition of an etal site, but <coughs> I want to restrict this definition to the locally spatial case because otherwise I don't know in general if there are enough etal maps and then uh, to not run into this potential problem, uh, I keep it out from the beginning. Um, so x etal, the site is supposed to be all the y to x, which are etal maps. And unfortunately, I don't know whether this really implies that y is a locally spatial diameter automatically. Uh, so I just ask it again. So this follows if the map is in addition quasi separated, but in the non quasi separated case, I don't know. I mean, it's automatically a diamond. The question is whether it's locally spatial. So this part is always okay, it's automatic, and this is automatic, y to x is quasi-separated. If x is just a diamond, uh, I can define this quasi proital side, q proital, uh, to be our quasi proital maps. Yeah, let me say it, but it's automatic. Why is a diamond? It's automatic. And then finally, you can also uh, go all the way to the V topology. So if X is just any small V sheaf, I define XV to be <coughs> all maps from Y to X where Y is a small V sheaf. And in all cases, covers are given by families of surjective maps. Covers are given is this that's some saturatic thing, right? It means that there is a surjection from some perfectoid space onto it. <coughs> I mean, modulo set theoretic issues, you can always find such a surjection from a perfectoid space by just taking over all possible perfectoid spaces and all maps into Y. You take the disjoint union of all of them and then you map it to it. This would be surjective. <laughs> hmm? uh, all maps are automatically etal, yeah. And all maps here are automatically quasi pro uh, Let me make this remark in a second. Uh, are given by families of jointly surjective families of I mean surjective here is sh sheaves
automatically it's on. And so maybe one, one is really interested in uh, is the Talco module, so you want the Tau side. But on the other hand, <coughs> in many cases, you, like diamonds are defined by just quasi proital equivalence relations, and so you need to make a lot of at least quasi proital descent, and sometimes it's even easier to do V descent. And so you need to know how sheaves on these various different sides are related. And it turns out that the relation is actually as simple as possible. Um, OK, let me from now on also fix a coefficient ring <coughs> before stating the theorem. Uh, some coefficient ring lambda such that m times lambda is 0 for some m prime to p. So, of course, there are maps of sites, and then also uh, these are very nice sites. So, we get all associated maps of topoi. So, we can pull back sheaves from the etal side to the quasi pro etal side, and then further back to the V side. <coughs> and uh, these pullback functors turn out to be fully faithful. So, These four embeddings. <coughs> uh, so by a tilde, I denote the category of sheaves. So this is a topos. So Um, where, I mean, in all cases where it makes sense. So in the first case, I can ask that this is true if X is a locally spatial diamond. <coughs> and in the second case, if I can ask this if X is a diamond. So now concerning <laughs> the tal topos rather than the tal side, can one define what should be the tal topos for non-locally spatial things? Or yes, by descent. Yes, by descent somehow. Uh, so <coughs> uh, maybe I state this right now. So uh, <coughs> containment in these subcategories can be defined v locally. Can we check v locally? Uh, let me just give one example of what I mean by this. Uh, X prime to X is a surjective map of locally spatial diamonds. Um, and F is a V-sheaf on X, 
then if the pullback lies in uh, uh, say it's hall topos, which sits inside the v topos, then f actually lies. So this means that for a general v, uh, say small v sheaf, uh, you can define <coughs> a category which would be some of the tall topos as a category of all v sheaves, which have the properties if whenever you pull back to a locally spatial diamond, uh, they lie in the subcategory. And this is something which then becomes a v stack. So. Uh. So. And similarly for quasi projectile sheaves. Right, similarly for quasi projectile sheaves. Uh, so, for general small v sheaf. <coughs> uh, can define full subcategories. I mean, yeah, so, so far the lambda didn't appear, sorry, there will be a part three and four of this, where the lambda will appear. <coughs> <coughs> so we will need a similar result for derived categories of lambda modules, and uh, that is also true. <coughs> I mean, yeah, checking this fully faithfulness, of course, because you have this adjunction, it's equivalent to saying that some adjunction map is an isomorphism. <coughs> okay, and so. Um, you also have full inclusions. Uh, so pullback again induces full face full embeddings. Um, from the D plus on the A tau side of X. This is a derived category of lambda modules on the Tau side. Uh, this is bounded be low cohomologically. Um, <coughs> derived category. Of lambda modules. On the top side. <coughs> so this is um, for any locally special diamond. Uh, contained in the and uh, I could write a plus here tautologically, but for the next statement I actually remove the plus. Um, and then if x is a diamond, it's even true that the next passage works on the unbounded thing. Uh, <coughs> and this biggest guy, I actually want to abbreviate it just as the dx comma lambda. And so then there are conditions that it somehow comes is some quasi pro etal guy, and there's a further condition that's an etal guy. Um, <coughs> sometimes you actually get this uh, 
on the uh, unbounded guy, so sometimes you actually get full inclusion of dx et al lambda into here. Um, but that only works if x is strictly totally disconnected. You mean there are cases where it doesn't work? I mean, this is related to some left completeness of the etal uh, of this dx etal. So if, the, if x etal has some unbounded cohomological dimension, there are some convergence issues here with Postnikov towers. And oh no, for, uh, for non-abelian cohomology, it should also be true. Okay, you can also do non-abelian, yeah. Let's, let's stick to the set or abelian group case. Uh, And so the last part is the analog of two, that uh, containment in these subcategories can be checked V-locally. And you need prime to P. I, let's see, for this statement right now, uh, I can try to look it up in the manuscript. But, uh, so some parts work without being primed to P. I'm not sure if this already needs it. Let me see what I'm writing here. Uh, here I don't seem to have any assumption. Uh, I think this covers all of everything. Yeah, so th I think this statement is still true without prime to p. Yes. So this works actually for any ring lambda, if you want. Without torsion, yeah. Uh, okay, so containment, and also part four. Yeah, so. And so this means that for any small v-sheaf, x, we can define. So inside this full derived category, uh, which makes sense, even for just for a small v-sheaf, uh, you can define four subcategories. Uh, and let me switch uh, the position of the subscript to the left because now the x quasi proital doesn't make sense, but this d quasi proital does make sense. Uh, no, you said that you can define what the notion of quasi proital shift and attached. Yeah. Okay, if I were to put a tilde somewhere instead, it might be. But I'm not actually sure if that's the same thing, right? Right, I don't know that there are enough of them. But so they might, this might not be the derived category of anything itself. Um, and this maybe contains the d plus et al. Next lambda. Uh, what's the following property? Uh, such that uh, this is equal to this x quasi proital lambda if x is a diamond. Uh, this d at plus x lambda 
is equal to the d plus x a tau lambda of x is locally spatial diamond. And for the other guy, I need to assume it's strictly totally disconnected. Otherwise, it's a left completion of this guy. Strict totally disconnected what? A perfectoid space. So for those things lying in the subcategory, is it enough to just look at the cohomology shifts and use the conditions there? Or? Yes, that's equivalent. So you can, if you want to check whether some object here lies in one of these guys, it's enough to check it on the cohomology shifts. Okay. And it is true that for the so the ones where you write unbound, the, the derived category is what you say is left complete. That anything is a is the derived limit of its truncation. Right. So these cate derived categories are left complete. Everywhere where I don't put a plus, they are actually left complete. Which is what allows me to do anything. Okay. Okay. Um, so basically what I'm trying to do here is to get all the basic definitions, uh, to have some available in the most general setting possible. So, uh, and this kind of works. Um, uh, okay, well, what do I want to say? Ah, I wanted to say how to actually check and practice. What does it actually mean to line these subcategories? Okay. Um, so how to check containment. <coughs> um, so let's say x is a small v sheaf and k is in the derived category of lambda modules on x. Then the first thing I want to say is that being such a quasi proital sheaf is saying that the sheaf is invariant, invariant under change of algebraically closed space field uh, in the following sense. Um, Uh, so I want to say the following, if f from x2 to x1 over x um, is a map of strictly totally disconnected effectoid spaces. over x, um, such that f is a, um, yeah, on an underlying topological spaces, it's a homeomorphism. <coughs> then the value on k on x1 and x2 agree. So why do I say this is invariance under change of algebraically closed space field? <coughs> but the strictly totally disconnected guys, they essentially are just profinite sets of geometric points. So let's forget about this profinite set. So then both of these would be just geometric points. So this would be automatic somehow. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, yes. X. <coughs> uh, then, well, these would be both points, so it's a homeomorphism. And then, <coughs> well, it's just a map of geometric points. 
And so you're just enlarging some algebraically closed field here. And well, to get the correct statement, you somehow need to do this with a profinite set in place. OK, so I didn't yet finish the statement. Uh, uh, one has that if you evaluate this complex on x1, it maps isomorphically via some of upper star to the value of this one. Maybe here you need the n prime to p. Uh, do you really want to know for every statement whether I need n prime to p? I mean, can I, I can look it up? I would like the enough technicalities here already. So I think this could still be true in general. Um, I mean, I think this is still for any lambda. Including torsion, I think so. <laughs> but if it's not true, I don't take responsibility. Yeah. Um, I will check during the break, okay? Um, I think this is also true for any lambda. Uh, so now I want to check whether it's in the tall guy. So, so assume it's already passed the first test. It lies in this quasi proton. Then k lies in the tau x lambda if and only if. <coughs> um, you have some kind of uh, uh, commutation, I mean, some kind of some kind of finite presentation thing um, that it takes the cohomology of an inverse limit is a direct limit of the cohomologies. So for if and only if for all co-filtered inverse systems of spatial diamonds, um, let's call them yi mapping to x, um, and limit y infinity, which is again spatial. The value on y infinity of k is just a direct limit of the values on the y axis. So for spectral spaces, you can have non-spectral maps, and here it doesn't occur that is right. Any map between analytic eddic sp or eddic spaces is always locally spectral. So it's a spectral map. So. Um, so this is actually interesting in both directions. Uh, it's also interesting to know that if you have something which lies on the tar side, then you can compute cohomology on an inverse limit by just taking the direct limits of the cohomologies. But on the other hand, it also characterizes uh, this. And uh, it's probably true that you don't need to check this for all guys, but you can somehow make it further assumptions if you want. You mean? Uh Totally disconnected and stuff like that. Yes, I think you can just check this for inverse limits of strictly totally disconnected guys. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Well, if I say it's strictly totally disconnected, I always implicitly mean it's a perfect space. So. All right, so I guess it's time for a break. So let's have a break of 15 minutes. OK, uh, let's continue. Um, <coughs> so now we have these kinds of derived categories. And uh, 
we know what it means to be quasi proletariat, huh? And hmm? ah, yes, I checked. It works for any lambda so far. Okay. <laughs> uh, but now it becomes important. So uh, so now we want to uh, do the simplest kind of operation. Well, we can do pullback. So let, maybe let me just first do pullback, just to have it done. So. Uh, I mean, that's essentially a lot tautology. Uh, if this is uh, any map of small v sheaves, then <coughs> as a pullback from dy lambda to dy prime lambda uh, preserves full subcategories. D quasi proletar and D is huh? <coughs> and, uh, and then it agrees with. I mean, so this F upper star is some of the pullback uh, for the induced functor of these sides of V tau pi. Uh, and it agrees with the. A Effectively, but you also have such guy pullback functors just on the etal or quasi proetal sides. Uh, if these guys, one by primer diamonds, respectively locally spatial diamonds. Then you need the D plus in some cases. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, I can only say this for the d plus. Yeah. Uh, F plus on d plus it all, uh, respectively. F it all up a star. Respectively, strictly. <coughs> Perfect to its basis. <coughs> so if I and Y prime, for example, are diamonds, then I just previously said that this quasi proital derived category is the same thing as the derived category on the quasi proital site. And so you would have a different functor a priori um, relating these uh, draft categories on the quasi proetal side, given by pullback, and there's an induced ma map there, but it's the same thing. And uh, this is still for any lambda. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's the simplest operation, but now let's uh, go one step further. Let's try to push forward. And so now it's really important that n lambda is equal to zero where np n is prime to p. Um, so Again, we are in the situation that f from sometimes they call them x, sometimes they call them y. Let's say again y prime to y um, is a map of small v sheaves. I mean, it's basically the same statement. Um, which is the RF e lower star. Preserves the full subcategories. And I have to be a little bit careful. Uh, D quasi proetal 
and also the DATAR plus, but not in general the DATAR. Sorry, uh, DATAR plus. Uh, So this is in general. It preserves the DHL plus if F is QCQS. <coughs> right. um, And so again, if I invite primer diamonds, then it agrees with uh, RF Chipotle And if I invite primer locally spatial diamonds, <coughs> I mean on the D quasi quartile. In this case, it's a D of C, then quasi point on. And F is QCQS. Then it agrees with the R epitalo star. On the D plus etal which in this case is the same as a D plus of blank guitar. <coughs> okay. So in some sense, it's the first statement which actually has some input. Um, let me say what goes into this. For the quasi proitar case, we need invariance of a tar cohomology under change for algebraic speed base field. So let me just write cohomology. It reduces to a tar cohomology of some reasonable guys. Uh, That's because checking that maps something in the D quasi proitar into itself, you somehow have to check that the image satisfies uh, this condition here, <coughs> uh, which means that some of the cohomology of Y prime with these coefficients is invariant <laughs> under this change of algebraically closed space field. And so this, uh, so this really needs that n times lambda is zero, where n is prime to p. And how to prove this, you reduce it to a, st uh, reduce to a statement of Huber. Um, for usual, uh, some kind of rigid spaces. So this involves some elaborate limit procedures uh, using such limits like this. Uh, to eventually reduce to some stuff which is of finite type. And then what Huber does is that in turn he reduces a statement about some rigid spaces of finite type <coughs> to schemes by uh, using nearby cycles and uh, uh, that nearby cycles are invariant in a change of algebraic closed space field and the usual algebraic statement.
base field in the algebraic statement. <coughs> and so all this formalism works well enough really to, I mean, it's maybe kind of surprising that you can uh, get statements about all of these species by some elaborate reduction to the Nusserian case. Well, works. Um, <coughs> and for it all, uh, well, for it all, you need to check this commutation that it takes an inverse limit of spaces to a direct limit of cohomologies. But this is actually, uh, yeah, that's so hard. So. Um, I mean, essentially, you just use the characterization. <coughs> so the hard part is the invariance on the change of algebraic to closed space field. Okay, um, I claim that the formal consequence of the theorem is a base change result. <coughs> and so because it's a corollary to this theorem, if it of course again needs these assumptions. Um, so this is a quasi-compact, quasi-separated base change. Uh, it says the following, if uh, it's like y2x, uh, say so this is a Cartesian diagram of locally special diamonds. And F is QCQS. <coughs> uh, then base change holds true. the natural base change map from, let me see if I have names in the same way I have my notes. Uh, prime list, uh, uh, and here I always mean the et al operation. So I assume I would only be interested somehow in locally, maybe I am, I'm only interested in locally spatial diamonds in their et al cohomology, then I would be looking at uh, this kind of map, <coughs> which is a map from the d plus et al of uh, y to the d plus et al of x prime. Sorry, I mean, I can also write this really as a d plus of the et al side here. Yeah. X prime. <coughs> uh, then this is an so this is an analog to the result uh, for uh, quasi combined quasi separated maps of, uh, of added spaces. Right, so Kuba has a similar theorem for analytic attic spaces um, under some Nusserian hypotheses. Uh, and this generalizes Huber's statement, at least for the analytic analytic spaces over ZP, because uh, 
well, maybe I should say this again. So if you have an analytic attic space over ZP, then the Etat side of the associated diamond is the same thing as the Etat side of X itself. So if you care about analytic attic spaces over ZP, then <coughs> you can now prove theorems about them by regarding them as diamonds and then using these general statements about diamonds. Uh, so, uh, mark. it implies same result. Final integrated spaces over ZP. S for such X. Uh, something holds true that I already stated last time that the toss side of x is equal to the toss side of the diamond. <coughs> and so this is due to Huber uh, under the Syrian conditions. Why is this a corollary to the theorem? <coughs> well, the theorem tells us that <coughs> we may replace this operation on the tau side by the operation on the v side everywhere, and all the operations are compatible. So, But what does it mean to push forward on the V side? It automatically means that you already sheafify on all possible things mapping to X. So actually, uh, well, some, uh, base, base change to a slice in the topos is always a formality. And so base change in the V topology is actually the tautology. So x prime v is the sum of the slice of x v over x prime is a slice. The v topology. And base change to slice is this formal. Slice? Uh, well, it's just uh, all the objects mapping to some object on your side. Just the localization. Okay, um, so that seems like a pretty general base change result. In particular, it seems better than proper base change because proper maps were in particular required to be QCQS. Unfortunately, um, things work slightly differently with edX spaces than with schemes. And uh, so this somehow doesn't give you the full analog of proper base change for some reason. So. Warning. <coughs> so 
So the next thing I want to do is I want to actually define the RF lower shriek functor. And then I need to show that this is well behaved. And then I hope I will come to this. I will say at one point where the usual proper base change theorem for schemes enters a proof. And so only at this point, we really have used the full analog of proper base change. <coughs> and we also see that so far we haven't used anything like proper base change in the world of schemes. Uh, we haven't put this into the theory. So. May I ask you a stupid yes. question? <laughs> can an open immersion be QCQS? Yes, an open immersion can be QCQS. And then if you take G, the complementary uh, closed immersion. There is no complementary closed immersion for QCQS open immersions. Ah. <laughs> the problem is that. Uh, it's a subtlety with higher rank points. So whenever you have an edX space, the map will be generalizing, but this complementary closed subset will not be generalizing. And so the, that's exactly related to this warning there, actually. <coughs> uh. Uh. Um. So now we have... Uh, as a functor uh, floor star. I mean, you can also easily define a tensor product in some derived tensor product over lambda. Um, <coughs> there's also no issue with defining an R hom, except you, and maybe uh, you have to be a bit careful about uh, this change of topology. this guy. Um, <coughs> but I mean these operations in principle they are just formal. Uh, tensoring and taking an R home. Um, so what we still really need are functors RF lower shriek and RF upper shriek. So for uh, such things there are like for the R home there are results on change of topology that come from what you explained before or not? Um, no I mean well, if you map something into something else, then usually this is only, like this commutation with direct limits, for example, in order to be tall, you need that the thing you map out of is compact and things like this. So, yeah. <coughs> okay, so we want to define a functor. Okay, so that makes, makes this a heading. Functor RF lower shriek. <coughs> uh, so one very nice feature of edX spaces is that they have canonical compactifications. if they have any. But they don't look like what you would expect a compactification to look like. Um, so let me first do an example because it's really important to first understand this one example. <coughs> So let's that, say that K is some non acumenian field, complete non acumenian field. And let's say B is a closed unit disk. Concretely, it's the eddic spectrum of K adjoint T or K adjoint T. Uh, it's a closed unit disk. Then what is the compactification? So how to compactify B bar B? Well, usually you would maybe probably embed this via an open immersion into something like P1. <coughs> but you might just embed this into many other proper smooth curves over your field if you want. And so this doesn't 
This wouldn't be canonical. Embedded into some negative curve. Uh, so this is not canonical. But actually what happens is that you can let P bar be the closure of P and P1 and a priori this is maybe just the topological space but actually it has a natural structure as an affinite attic space namely it is the attic space for the same ring except that you mess, a mess around a little bit with this subring here. Uh, Look at OK plus the maximal ideal. Joint so these are all the functions which mod over the residue field would be constant. So this is some, uh, another open and integrally closed subframe. <coughs> and so let me try to draw a picture. Um, so maybe you have the P1 here. And okay, so there's the way you usually draw pictures by getting your intuition from the complex numbers. And so then the picture would be like so that somewhere you have here the ball, which is one semisphere. <coughs> and then, well, but then the picture you know looks different because it actually has a Gauss point sitting somewhere near the boundary. This goes point. <coughs> uh, which is given by the supremum norm. So recall that points on your attic space were some variations or norms. <coughs> and one such norm is given by the evaluation uh, supremum or looking at the largest coefficient of such a power series. This gives you a point which and on the sits at the boundary. And this point happens to have one rank two specialization. So this is a rank one point. And it has a rank two specialization. Which lies outside the disk. Let's call this guy here X, this little guy. So this B bar will just be B union X. <coughs> and maybe it gives a formula for. What this variation is. So uh, x is given by sending a sum a and t to the n. That's the supremum of the absolute value of a to the n times gamma to the n, where, <coughs> where this is an element of the positive reals times gamma to the z, where it makes this, uh, this a totally order to be in group by asking that this gamma is infinitesimally larger than uh, and one. So four. If I have any real number which is bigger than one, then it's already bigger than this gamma. And so this is where you can define this. So this point x thinks that uh, t is infinitesimally bigger than one in absolute value. So it doesn't lie in the disk where the absolute value of t is less or equal to one, but it's very, very close to it. <coughs> So you have to take this union zero when you take the Okay, yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, let's say this is not a zero function. Okay, and so this B bar 
is not a finite type, but it's a wonderful attic space. <coughs> and let me maybe make one remark. Um, and maybe one of the key p points where I like the uh, Huber theory of attic space is better than the Berkowitz theory. Um, the difference between B bar and B makes uh, the compactly support cohomology of B with coefficients in, say, FL, uh, B FL in degree minus 2. And the compact support cohomology of this B bar, well, this is somehow already proper. This would be FL. So the usual cohomology of these guys, this would, guys would just be FL in degree 0 in both cases. But the compact support cohomology distinguishes very much between the two guys. And uh, I mean, this is actually what you want to have to have Poincaré duality on B. So, <coughs> um, whereas you get this answer. in Berkowitz's theory. So <coughs> in Berkowitz's theory, you also have a general notion of compactness about cohomology. And if you evaluate this for the ball, uh, Berkowitz's theory somehow can't distinguish between these, those, these two guys, and it will give you this answer, that's FL, which somehow means that for a space like the closed unit disk, you don't have Poincaré duality. Do you have it for B bar? Uh, you, you also don't have it for B bar. So Poincaré duality only holds for spaces of finite type in the end. So, okay. But you need these uh, <coughs> spaces which are not a finite type for which this formalism so far works beautifully. Uh, you need them to define compact support cohomology in a canonical fashion. The D and the P bar have the same cohomology? The cohomology is the same, yeah. It's both FL and degree 0. So on usual cohomology, you don't really see these higher rank points making any difference. But for compact support cohomology, they are crucial. OK. <coughs> All right, I have a few minutes. Uh, so let's try to talk about canonical compactifications of Vichy's. Ah, so uh, maybe I start with a proposition. <coughs> if f from y to x is proper, map of these sheaves, and spa r plus is a phenoid guy. Um, <coughs> then you have a more general kind of evaluative criteria, namely uh, <coughs> you also always have the space R R circ, where you somehow take the maximal possible R plus, um, which is uh, a subspace of spa R R plus y to x. And there always exists a unique map here. <coughs> and 
In other words, uh, if you're only interested in proper spaces, then for proper spaces, this extra uh, ingredient here, this R plus, doesn't make any, play any role. So. <clears throat> okay, and so uh, you can turn this kind of uh, thing around and make the following definition. Uh, if y is a separated, or x is a separated sheaf, you can also do this from maps. Um, let x bar, it will be its compactification, uh, be the thing which sends some spar r r plus, which is, and unfortunately, I have to restrict this to totally disconnected x. So guys, um, maps this to x of r r circ. So if you want to map this guy into the compactification, you only have to map the much smaller space by our circ, where you're somewhere essentially reduced to the rank one points. Uh, you only have to map those into x, and then you will automatically get a spreaded map into x bar. And similarly, if f from y to x is a separated map of these sheets, can also define a compactification over x, uh, which takes some spa r r plus. And maps it to um, an r r circ point of y, which is refined to an r r plus point of x. Uh, again, for totally disconnected. <coughs> so if you want to define a Vichy, if it's enough to define it on the basis for the topology, so it's enough to define it for those guys. And uh, the formula, so if I would evaluate then this x bar, the general thing, it wouldn't have this formula. So I need to make this restriction. Uh, right, so that's a proposition. So uh, that x bar, or also this y bar over x, are v sheaves. <coughs> um, uh, if x is also separated, sorry, I mean, in the second case, I don't assume that x is separated. But you can compute this as some kind of relative guy. So it's an com absolute compactification of y over the absolute compactification of x with x, uh, if x is separated. So that this makes sense. Um, and if, in fact, f from y to x is quasi-compact and separated, then the kind of compactification of f over x. Uh, this is pr always proper. Ah. Uh, I mean. There's a more general notion of being partially proper. So in general, this guy, f bar over x, is partially proper. P 
partially proper is something like uh, you forget quasi compacity, but you keep the evaluative criterion. <coughs> and the inclusion is an open inversion? So, yes, uh, no. Uh, so, there are natural maps. From X, injective maps. Uh, that's by separatedness. Uh, of X into X bar, or also from Y into the relative compactification over X. So, in general, you mean without quasi compact or without separated? We se uh, I mean, separated is somewhat necessary condition, so if F is separated. Uh, if this map is not even separated, I'm not even sure this is a V sheaf again. So it is separated and partially proper. The, the <laughs> So what does partially proper mean? Uh, it means it's separated and satisfies this condition up there. I mean, for all these guys, and there is a slightly different way of saying it, where you only have the variative criterion for fields, but then in the locally spatial case, it's equivalent, but then there was some other sub. Well, you need to assume it's taut also. Okay. I don't want to discuss partial proper guys. Um, uh, but they need not be open emergence. Uh, what am I saying? Open emergence. <coughs> well, you can just take the difference, but it's not an attic space again. So. Um, what you're adding here are somehow higher rank points. Uh, so any rank one point will be an X, but some higher rank points will be here. So this means that the boundary will never have the property that it's stable under generalizations, and hence the boundary will never have the property that it's uh, itself an attic space or a diamond or anything like that. Uh, topologically, you can make sense of it. Uh, maybe one example. I take the eddic spectrum of some RR plus and I compactify it. <coughs> then it's this bar R, and then you somehow put the minimal guy F plus plus R circ circ integral closure. So this is a minimal possible R plus. <coughs> so in this way, taking the compactification somehow forgets everything uh, about the up, up plus. <coughs> okay. Uh, so definition, a separated map from x to y of small v sheaves is compactifiable. If, if the map is an open version. It makes this definition even in the case where the map is not quasi-compact. <coughs> um, sorry, f bar over x. Sorry, no, 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 sorry. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. Sorry, it's just this map, isn't it? Sorry, thank you. So open immersion is representable by... Right, open immersion, so, uh, I should have defined this, means that whenever I map some perfectoid space onto it, the, the fiber product is representable and given by an open subspace of, of the sky. <coughs> and it is enough to check it locally. And yeah, it's also enough to check it V locally. Should have been one of the definitions at the beginning today.
All right, time's almost up. Let me nonetheless uh, finish with uh, definition. And okay, so let's assume I have such a map f from y to x, which is a quasi-compact, separated, and compactifiable map. Of small issues. <laughs> So you have y, y bar over x, it's compactification over x. Thanks. <coughs> and then I define our floor shriek to be. Uh, well, given by the usual formula. You extend by zero upstairs, and then you push forward. Yes, compactifiable, stable under composition. I mean, it's also compactifiable in the sense that uh, if there is any other compactification somewhere, so some open inversion to some proper space or partially proper space, then <coughs> also this open inversion to this kind of canonical guy, will this map will always be an open inversion itself. So if there is any compactification, I mean, what I said here, if there is, if there is any, then there is this canonical guy. <coughs> It's stable on the composition, and you can also check it v-locally, and uh, has all sorts of good properties. Um, okay, so we have this, and the theorem is the following. And then I stop. And uh, so here again, for these things, it's important that lambda is torsion prime to the characteristic. Um, So there's a notion that you are representable in spatial diamonds, meaning whenever you map a spatial diamond into it, the fire product is spatial again. Um, then this takes uh, the d plus. It's how y lambda into the d plus it how x lambda. <coughs> um, and it's compatible with composition. And base change. So for usual type of <coughs> proper wave change doesn't require prime to the characteristic. Uh, uh, you do have always prime to the p. So there's one part of the argument which doesn't need prime to the characteristic, but I'm afraid I'm using something else where I do need its prime to the characteristic. Because I'm defining this somewhat implicitly with the topology to start with. So in order to see that it's the same as a quasi proto thing, I already need Prime to the characteristic. For invariance on algebraic closed. Basic thing. So, uh, time is up. So, let me just comment by saying that, uh, so there are maybe three things to prove here, but uh, let's discuss these final two. That's compatible with composition and base change. Usually, what maybe expect that, I don't know, that something's compatible with composition should be easy and the base change should be hard, but actually, it's the other way around. 
So this is actually easy using what we already have done. Um, what's hard is composition. <coughs> and for this part, you actually need to use uh, uh, usual proper base change for schemes. Um, to prove a certain result about Sarovsky Riemann spaces. <coughs> so what happens here is that, for example, if I have spa K or K, and compactify it. And then the underlying topological space is the same thing as the Tsarisky Riemann space of the residue field. <coughs> uh, which also shows that the map from spa K OK into here must, this is not an open immersion because this is just a generic point of the Tsarisky Riemann space mapping into here, and this is not an open immersion. <coughs> and so these kind of canonical compactifications automatically make these Sarisky Riemann spaces appear, which are these inverse limits of all uh, proper things with this as a generic point. And <coughs> well, to prove something about them, some, some statement about the cohomology of Sarisky Riemann spaces, you need proper base change for schemes. All right, I need to stop here. Question? So the easy part that requires a hmm? The easy part requires a um, Are you actually right? Yeah, so this with composition, this result is actually something which, this result about Sarovsky Riemann spaces works even with p torsion coefficients, yeah. So here, this implies that it's compact. It is what? The Z hypothesis represented by special diamonds, diamonds implies the compact compactified alone. No, 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 sorry. I mean under these assumptions. Under these assumptions where it's defined. Yeah. I mean these these are I mean these are even perfectoid spaces here. I think that perfectoid spaces is spark okay, okay and it's compactification. <coughs> but still uh, the map is not an open immersion, it just takes it embeds the generic point into this huge service agreement space. Other questions? What's yeah. going to be in the next week? I mean, the second half. So, what's going to be in the second half? Well, I need to finish, uh, as I say, talk on module discussion. So, so far we have some uh, proper base change, but we still need something like smooth base change and proper duality. And uh, this kind of stuff may need another lecture. Um, and uh, But then finally, I want to get to Bungie. So, I want to. Uh, in particular, I really want to do the classification of reflexive sheaves on Bungie, let's say, are admissible representations, which is a basic finiteness result that underlies uh, the whole thing. Do you have Krenitz formula? Uh, you have Krenitz formula, you have a projection formula, and then the usual things apply. What is an example of non compact uh, This one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, somewhat compactifiable means that in this R plus, like you have the minimal choice, and then the, the condition that the spa R plus mapping into here is some of the condition that there are only finitely many inequalities imposed. So some of this R plus must be generated by just finitely many elements, in a sense. So it's what Huber calls plus weakly finite type, the plus weakly part. <laughs> I mean, Huber has this notion of a morphism of plus weakly finite type. And the plus refers to the condition that there is this plus subring is finitely generated in a sense. And so it's related to this notion of Huber. So, so when you have this notion, that it is compact, compact variable? Yes, but it's also equivalent in a sense. So, yeah. so, so that's how, because I, was, I had the Sorry. symmetric worry of uh, that, that is to say, how common is uh, compact variable maps? They are quite common. I mean, yeah. 
So for all the spaces that actually will appear in the geometric situation we're interested in, they will always be compactifiable. So whenever you build something from usual rigid spaces or something like this, uh, and even in some elaborate procedure, you usually preserve this notion of compactifiability. <coughs> Other questions? We'll take this chicken again.